Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's session of BIC Streams, the Ambedkar we need now. Joining us today are our panelists, Valerian Rodriguez, Anupama Rao, Suraj Yangide, and Asim Siddiqui. Welcome, everyone. Just a few announcements before we start. If you look to the bottom of your screen, you will see a chat box. We will use the chat box to share the bios of the speakers. Next to the chat screen in the same line is a Q&A box. You can type in your questions to the panelists in, in the Q&A box. For those of you who are on YouTube, you can use the comment section to ask your questions and we will uh, ask the same questions in, in the Zoom room here. Um, with that, over to you, Asim, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you, Raghu. Um, thank you very much, uh, BIC, for inviting all of us to this panel discussion. Um, first of all, uh, Jabhim to everyone. Uh, we are very happy to have uh, uh, all of you gathered here for the 129th uh, birth anniversary month of Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Um, and as you know, uh, uh, every year when Ambedkar um, Jayanti is celebrated and the month is celebrated, there are a lot of uh, conversations that happen around to uh, build the uh, legacy, build the contemporary relevance. And it has, a, it has been an ongoing journey. So this year too, we are kind of uh, building upon that. Uh, however, uh, as you can see, we are all uh, sitting in our uh, homes and doing this because of the current pandemic uh, uh, crisis that we are in. So. Uh, it's also important to uh, understand the current pandemic uh, and also the response to that pandemic in the Indian context, especially uh, with the kind of polarization that has also happened around it uh, from an Ambedkarite lens. So uh, what we will try to do is to both uh, provide you a, a, a kind of a historical, a kind of a broad context to these things, as well as uh, take you to very specific questions of the current pandemic and how uh, do we think of uh, understanding what is happening now, how do we think of uh, the future from an Ambedkarite lens. So all of these are uh, very kind of important and relevant questions for us. And uh, for that, we have very, uh, like very important panelists. I think uh, none of them really need introductions. So I'll uh, go straight into the uh, in, in inviting the panelists to speak. The format will be as follows. We will have around 12 to 15 minutes of each of the panelists speaking um, where they will uh, engage in a specific uh, way of looking at Ambedkar in today's context. And then uh, we will have a discussion among the panelists for around 20 minutes. Uh, and then we will open it for question and answers. Uh, so I would encourage you to keep posting your questions throughout the talk. Uh, please do, uh, we don't have to wait till the end. Please keep posting it. We will try to include them in our discussions and conversation. And uh, hopefully we will be able to address most of them. Whoever gets left, uh, it's, it's just a conversation. So we will take it uh, outside this panel discussion as well. Uh, now that everything is online anyways. So uh, uh, it's something that we can build upon. Okay, so um, I'll first invite uh, uh, Professor Anupama Rao to kind of uh, give uh, an historical context uh, to, to the kind of uh, uh, work that we are trying to do now is to contextualize uh, uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar's works and to look in a, in a very specific uh, uh, context of uh, the, major, the majoritarianism also that we are in. So she would illuminate uh, that dimension of uh, Baba Sao's work and help us contextualize it. Professor Anupam. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asim. And it's uh, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, so as Asim said, I will try to um, situate Ambedkar in his time and then to pull out a few issues that I think are relevant for what we might want to consider today. Uh, the question of global solidarity, how one might build solidarity amongst uh, marginal communities and the dispossessed. Ambedkar's critique of Hinduism and its relevance for us now. And then I think some of the um, current uh, questions that have arisen uh, around minority politics and uh, social violence. 
So the global pandemic is also, of course, a social catastrophe. The crisis of public health has exposed a deeper crisis and the resurrection of racialized and indeed, indeed eugenicist logics. The virus may not respect divisions of class and social difference, but the divide between those who have the luxury of sheltering in and those who cannot and whose lives appear to be disposable is indeed stark. It resembles the absolute divide between the touchables and the untouchables, one that B.R. Ambedkar argued governs not merely social life, but the long arc of subcontinental history itself. In many parts of the world today, social isolation has exacerbated poverty, addiction, and abuse, but this tends to be secreted away and hidden indoors. In India, the mass migration of the unemployed poor, their desperate congregation around sites offering food, and the boycott of Dalits and Muslims from public amenities, such as hospitals and access to drinking water, are images we're unlikely to easily forget especially because they reproduce age-old practices of social exclusion and caste power. This visual archive of dehumanization shows us how the virus, which appears as an order of nature, has weaponized caste and class inequality. The virus is indeed biopolitical. So what can Ambedkar, that insurgent thinker of radical democracy, offer us today? What bearing does his analysis of the downtrodden and the dispossessed have for us? We can only think about Ambedkar's relevance now if we're able to appreciate how deeply he spoke to the issues of his time, also a moment of crisis and emergency. We can creatively repurpose our Ambedkar by maintaining fidelity to his passion and purpose. And it's with this in mind that I want to take up three themes or questions. The first is the question of global solidarity and historical comparison. As you well know, Ambedkar was amongst the most learned thinkers of the 20th century, and he brought this to bear on a systematic understanding of the caste order. We know, of course, of his extensive conversations with Indian liberals, with Gandhi, of course, and the socialists. But from his very first work, written as a seminar paper for a class in anthropology at Columbia in 1915, to his writings in the 1940s, which track the history of untouchability, texts such as Who Were the Untouchables, Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Ancient India, among others, Ambedkar mobilized historical comparison to show both what was distinctive about caste, what makes it unique, and to reflect on how untouchability resembled other forms of historical discrimination and inequality. In many of his writings, Ambedkar offers a keen comparison between caste and race. Anti-caste thinkers from the late 19th century had long used slavery Gulam Giri, the title of Jyoti Rao Phule's 1873 text, to address caste power, historical privilege, and the economic order of caste. Now, Ambedkar's own engagements with universal history addressed slavery in the Greco-Roman period and in the Atlantic world. And quite remarkably, he notes that the slave's life is better. The slave was protected because their labor produced value, while the outcasts owned by no one were shunned and denigrated and their labor devalued. In 1946, Sambedkar writes a letter to W.E.B. Du Bois, the great philosopher of race, probably the greatest philosopher of race of the 20th century, and requests copies of a petition submitted to the UN by Black Americans. Ambedkar identifies himself there as a student of the Negro problem who belonged to the untouchables of India and asserts, and I quote, there was so much similarity between the position of untouchables in India and the positions of, uh, position of Negroes in America, that the study of the latter is not only natural, but necessary. Du Bois, in his response to Ambedkar, confirms that he knew of him and encloses his draft statement for the Nas National Negro Congress. Now, Du Bois himself often described race as color caste. Before him, Senator Charles Sumner and one Alexander Crummel, who was associated with the church, had each described race as what they called an aristocracy of color and a caste system. Writing about the United States, Sumner notes, and I quote again, here the caste claiming hereditary rank and privilege is white, the caste doomed to hereditary degradation and disability is black or yellow. Sumner goes on to note that the white man is not unlike the Brahmin, while the black man is an inferior caste, not unlike the Shudra, sometimes even the Pariah. 
a cast school of sociology would spring up in the interwar period with scholars like Gunnar Myrdal and Oliver Wendell Cox taking positions on the race caste comparison. If we follow these associations, we see Ambedkar thinking about the history of democracy from quite early on, but noting that this is a history vexed by the paradoxical relationship between slavery and democracy, slavery and the Republic. Other solidarities were imagined with the Jews and the mass expulsions that have come to define the global history of the 20th century, and indeed with India's other minorities, with Muslims, though this was a fraught relationship caught up in colonial policies of divide and rule. Solidarity across the globe, the turn to internationalizing the caste question, was one market feature of Ambedkar's thought. The other, of course, is the critique of Hinduism. And it was caste's relationship to religion, to Hinduism, that obsessed Ambedkar across his lifetime, as we well know. Here, again, from quite early on, Ambedkar makes, begins to make an argument that caste is a mimetic structure, a system of graded inequality, where lower castes imitate the higher castes, even as they evince contempt towards those lower beneath them in the caste hierarchy. It is this which makes caste difficult to challenge, and Ambedkar con uh, continuously brings up this problem, and notes that everyone but the untouchable, the outcast, has an investment in the perdurance of the system of caste. Because caste was what we might call a social totality, the response to it also needed to be total. It required annihilation. As you know, this is the most famous text that Ambedkar writes in 1936, The Annihilation of Caste. Here it was Ambedkar's criticism of upper caste reformers that we should note, that they seek to excise caste of its noxious aspects, believing reform is possible. But caste governs who you marry, who you eat with, it decides access to capital and to public space. Most of all, Ambedkar argues, caste is ideological by which he means that caste comes to be naturalized, much as we might naturalize the free market today. And it's for this reason that Ambedkar makes the project of what we might call mass intellectuality, of claiming the right to think as the first and indeed the most significant right for remaking the rational self. Ambedkar tells us that rather than the natural order of things, Caste is a historical accident, that it's a contingent event. It didn't have to be this way. And here, Ambedkar does something quite distinctive, unlike almost any other thinker of his time. He gives to untouchability, analytic, historical, and explanatory force in explaining Hindu religion, what he calls Brahmanism. And it is this which allows him to pose the question, a rather profound one, about the possibility of ethics and equality within religion. As we know, Ambedkar argued for a world historical conflict between Buddhism and Brahmanism, between outcast and upper caste. And he argued that with the defeat of Buddhism, Hindu religion was established as a structure of rules that lacks ethics, one that doesn't allow for personal cultivation. Echoing one of his teachers, the philosopher John Dewey, Ambedkar argues religion must mainly be a matter of principles. It can't be a matter of rules. The moment it degenerates into rules, it ceases to be religion as it kills responsibility, which is the essence of a truly religious act. And it is that responsibility that Ambedkar claims for the reclamation, if you will, of Buddhism, which reverberated well beyond the immediate event of his conversion. Though it was broadcast as an act of human emancipation, the conversion to Navayana Buddhism a Buddhism of Ambedkar's very own making, as we know, was also deeply consequential as a social and a political statement. Indeed, Ambedkar saw this as more important perhaps than his constitutional interventions, which had prioritized imagining equality for a complex society such as India's by articulating support for group and not merely individual rights, and which unlike other policies of affirmative action, made the equality of outcome, at least in the first uh, three decades or so of the Republic, rather than the equality of opportunity, the stated end of affirmative action, of remediation. Now, critical Ambedkarism demands that we think about questions Ambedkar might not have anticipated, and that we bring the qualities of his own insurgent thinking to bear upon them. 
So I wanna end by raising three particular uh, issues or um, points of concern that we might want to think about together. The first is that the way Hindu nationalism has come to power today is by a complex combination of assuaging upper caste pride and placating lower caste hurt. The decades old positioning of the scheduled caste as the preeminent Hindu warrior ready to avenge Hindu hurt has taken on increasing importance amidst the competitive pressures of the electoral arena, where in the absence of meaningful social and economic policies with adequate positive outcome, cultivating communal antagonism yields a reliable quotient of support. Second and relatedly, the project of unifying the numerous subcasts with polluting occupations who are ostracized on that account and of overcoming the distinctions or the discrimination amongst untouchable communities was a political and a juridical task that Ambedkar had engaged in from very early on, from the 1910s onwards. The constitutional abolition of untouchability was its capstone. But we should consider whether 30 years, nearly 30 years after the demolition of the Babri Masjid, arguably a milestone in the shifting balance between religious communities in India, retrospectively legally sanctioned, the Hindu nationalists attempt to disintegrate that coalition by co-optation and cultivation of local and regional tensions between subcasts has made a difference. And if Dalits today are arrayed across a wider political spectrum than before, that is for instance in 1956, with sections of them being pulled into the project of the BJP. Finally, we might ask what the democratization of Hindutva via the electoral arena has meant. Now, the principle that Ambedkar had discerned of an external unifying bond across the Saverna castes or the shared ostracism of the untouchable now has a complement, namely the collective antagonism towards the Muslim as a means of defining the political Hindu. The register of exclusion here has shifted from untouchability to invisibility, I suggest, which in both cases offers double jeopardy to the excluded category. Muslims today increasingly become visible when they are a scandal and invite spectacular and overt violence. Invisible, they endure an institutionalized violence. And this, it seems to me, the current conjuncture that we're in poses a new set of questions about how we might think about not merely global solidarity, but an effort to rethink minority politics, as it were, to challenge Hindu majoritarianism, the ways in which the political economy of caste today increasingly structures our political space. And lastly, and of course, quite significantly, the ways in which a kind of exacerbated uh, domain of political communication uh, is the only possible mode of entry into our public sphere and what it means in terms of thinking about questions of caste, of civility, and indeed the possibility of registers of democratic and ethical debate. And I think I'll stop with my comments there. Thank you, Professor Anupama. Uh, I think uh, you raised uh, several important concerns from uh, how Ambedkar kind of conceptualized these questions um, from his own experience and also uh, uh, not just an experience of an individual, but experience of the community, which is also something that you have uh, said in your earlier works. Um, and then also to look at the present uh, conundrum, right? As in, um, in, even in Annihilation of Caste, uh, Baba Sahib talks about how the only way for the uh, for all the so-called different caste groups to even come under a bracket is when they kind of polarize against the Muslims. And that seems to be uh, the Hindutva strategy uh, that they have perfected over uh, a period of time. And now it seems to be uh, like the fruition of it. But uh, how do we how do we kind of um, use your uh, way of looking at uh, from untouchability to invisibility, right? As in, and that is also something um, which we will uh, try to take it in with, with our uh, other panelists and how they kind of uh, respond to this question and bring that together. Uh, we have few questions already coming uh, in. We will uh, take that all uh, towards the later half of this uh, panel discussion. I'll now invite uh, Suraj to kind of, uh, yeah, Suraj, uh, as you know, he's a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Harvard University and has uh, 
has written a very explosive book uh, which came out last year on uh, caste matters. So I would uh, invite him to um, speak for around 12 to 15 minutes and then we will uh, listen to Professor Valerian. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Asim, uh, for, uh, for chairing the session. Uh, thank you so much, Ravi, Raghu and Lekha and uh, patrons of uh, BIC for constantly engaging in this interesting conversations and also greetings to Anu and Professor uh, uh, Rodriguez. Very good to see you both. Um, I think we, um, this, uh, you know, the whole, uh, 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 the whole phase of understanding a pandemic, uh, the COVID-19, uh, is, is, is almost uh, sim uh, similar to the experiences of how we understand uh, the uh, duality of uh, uh, physical as well as mental, uh, corporality as well as mentality, uh, purity, pollution, touchability and untouchability. I think we live in this uh, subtle uh, pre-existing and juxtaposing uh, dualisms in our life. And we try to negotiate ourselves through uh, either of uh, spaces as and when we get. Talking about uh, you know, the situation of uh, what we have today, especially through the Ambedkarite lens, I think it, 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 it merits a very critical and as well as very important response. I think if you have to address the issue of uh, the current pandemic as well as the other injustices that we uh, that we have in our society right now. Uh, Ambedkar comes as a profound thinker who could help us think about the issues more with, of course, his engagement with science as, a, uh, as, as, a, uh, as an option uh, to look for alternatives, uh, which is very much dis, uh, disowning uh, certain orthodox past, which are not scientific, but also in his uh, measures to address injustices. Um, through his lens, I think what we see, especially in the Indian context, and of course I'll, I'll eventually pan out to the globe, but within the Indian context, what we saw uh, were, uh, especially with the outbreak of this pandemic in the Indian context was, first was the sudden uh, uh, unpreparedness of the, of the regime. Um, and, and the second part was how it has uh, communalized uh, the, the entire spectrum of this pandemic. I mean. Uh, a virus also has now a caste as well as a religion. A virus has, a, a, the virus pandemic ha, is, is a Dalit, is Adivasi or a Muslim. And I think uh, we, have, we have mastered the technique of uh, even uh, uh, poisoning uh, the nature's uh, own terminologies. So uh, let's, let's first look at the uh, migration, how it kind of comes about to us of, of uh, the intrastate migrants in India. Uh, uh, are, are about 395 million. Of those, uh, 62 million are Dalits and 31 million are Adivasis. Uh, so when the, when, the, when the migration or quote unquote, the outbreak or, or, or the crisis kind of erupted where this long march and long walk of the migrants took place, horrendous uh, visuals, of course, uh, uh, were, were, were available on the screen. Now, if we, if, if, if we, if we study the pattern of this, the advisors to the prime minister's office, as well as his economic advisors, who encouraged him, the prime minister, uh, to announce such sudden uh, break, uh, lockdown and create such a panic, resembles the uh, insensitivity of the people who are sitting in the power corridor, uh, cor uh, corridors and trying to encourage or implement policies that are very much rooted on the death of Dalits and excuse me, Dalits and Adivasis. Uh, the PMO, as we know, is dominated by Brahmins, uh, of the Prime Minister's office, who continue to have uh, this lack of utter uh, 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 silence on the issues, or if they let alone, they didn't even consult the people who belong to this migrant communities. Now, the the prospect of uh, 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 touchability and untouchability, the distancing part, and you know, I think Indians have mastered social distancing, more the Brahmins, because they know how to, uh, how, how to maintain that purity, how to maintain the distance. Uh, I remember if I would go to a local shaukar or a baniya uh, to buy uh, my grocery for the house or every little chocolate, uh, I never, now I thought in my uh, intro retrospection 
the Brabaniya never touched my hand while we were exchanging the money. Uh, he always asked me to put the money on the counter. And if I had to take any chocolate or any candy, he would just ask me to put my hand inside it. But he would never engage uh, the, the physical touch of this. And I think this, this kind of essential practice, now we already do that. It's, it's just in a, in a more advanced form. What I fear more is this will give more reasons for the bigots and the casteists to continue the legacy of untouchability by now bringing a new justification to their own fallacies of avoiding uh, human touch. Ambedkar is very interesting when he kind of brings out the analysis of untouchability uh, within in his, in his treatise, uh, The Untouchables, uh, a, a very searing analysis where he kind of propounds the view uh, cordon sanitaire, uh, which is uh, which was which was a, a French term, and you know during the plague, plague was plague is not new. Plague has been one of the, uh, 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 if not the but the penultimate cause of uh, you know deaths uh, pre World War One, uh, where uh, people uh, massive people uh, lives were lost in in swipe in in a short duration, and so cordon sanitaire was where they raised. Uh, fences or walls to to cordon uh, the people who were infected of the disease just to avoid the spread. Now Ambedkar brings this analysis to the idea of untouchability and he says how and I and I quote him he says putting the impure people inside a barbed wire into a sort of cage. In the Indian context this putting the people into this barbed wire and I think barbed wire is very important analysis for us because you can't risk crossing it because if you cross you might hurt yourself and I think this barbed wires which are the Brahminical dictions, the Brahminical codes of conduct will follow you if you, uh, if you avoid or if you try to uh, surpass uh, the, uh, the, uh, the sanitary or, or, the, or the cordon nation or, 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 or the people who are cordon. In the Indian context, instead of raising walls or fences or even creating barbed wire, we have what we call in, invisibilized force of practice, where one is heavily uh, indoctrinated into believing of a certain ideology that continues to act as a powerful, invisible force. And now, within the migrant labor context, we have to understand why Dalit and Adivasis are important in our, under, in, in our whole debates. Uh, the majority of migrants, as I gave the number, is Dalit and Adivasi. But more importantly, these are rural to urban migrants or rural to town migrants, you know, however you describe semi-urban locality. 43 days of labor was lost uh, to the scheduled caste, just because of various kinds of discriminations were, Im were imposed on them in the villages. So now if you are a daily wage worker, you can't afford to lose an employment for 43 days regularly because you go to work today morning and today tonight, you get, you get, you get a meal. So 43, 43 days of discrimination, it happens once uh, every year. That means it's, 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 it's a death situation for the lit. So what do they do? 71% of farm workers of these who are discriminated went to the urban areas. And I think within the urban periphery, these are the people who are our uh, servants, who are our uh, now the delivery people, uh, security staff and all. And I think this is where we need to bring out the class analysis because class analysis helps us uplift uh, the rural peripheries uh, that, that do not necessarily entertain. Within the, uh, within the pandemic, we have to also focus on how uh, privatization of essential industries have actually come at the cost of uh, first, I mean, I'm, uh, of course, two important things that needs to be immediately deprivatized is what I think. First is of course, education, the education institutions. Second is hospitals, because right now we have slightly more than 1% only spent on health infrastructure in India. And, and that too, it's a state facility where uh, uh, improper facilities are, are still uh, very much uh, part of the uh, whole regimen of the, of the health industry. Uh, we spend 1,657 rupees per person uh, for when it comes to the health cost compared to America, which spends 70,000 rupees per person. And again, US is again a privatized industry. And yet within that, we see a, 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 whole, a whole lot of difference on, on, on a scalar level. In addition with that, we have just one hospital for 55,591 people. Indians. So if there's one hospital for these many people, there is only one doctor for 11,000 patients. And if you, if you go into looking at the uh, ICUs, uh, how many ICUs we have, and, and again, the number gets more and more depressing. 
Now, if you have to understand this pandemic, Albert Camus had written this famous novel in 1947 called The Plague, wherein he actually raised the issues beyond nature. He talked about how human conditions are predicated on oppressing other human beings. And I think that gives more permission, more reason, excuse me, for the virus to spread across the, uh, uh, you know, uh, to, to spread. And, and, and then that's where the, the selfishness of a human uh, endurance kind of brings, comes to the, comes to the fore. Now, I think in this pandemic, in this orgy of pandemic, no one is untouchable. Everybody is going to get the, uh, the taste of untouchability. But again, the privileged untouchability, which is basically the class untouchability. If you are a class untouchable, you, no one can touch you, you are the top 1%. But if you are a declassed and caste untouchable, then you are the most wretched and you are the most oppressed. Within this wider spectrum, the religion and superstition is playing its part very well. Each religious, whether it be mullahs or be it the Buddhist monks or be it the, uh, the Hindu temples or the, the, the padres, a pastor of Christian, uh, especially in Indian context, a fabulous amount of superstition has been promoted by all of these religious heads. The ones I've, I've pronounced in some way, they were asking to kill a pigeon's uh, 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 flesh for a cure and somewhere they just said we should chant and i think this is where it goes against the very grain of how you how you encourage and i think instead of science taking precedence uh, to counter this uh, what has happened is uh, the, the the religious doctrines have actually uh, pulled us back in uh, you know uh, to 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 several mile and it actually has derailed our our, our progress into this final point um, Within the larger context of pandemic, uh, where the world over, uh, the prisoners are being released who are having, uh, who are who are still under trials and who have not been convicted for serious crimes. In India, it's 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 uh, the the prison system as well as state is forcing uh, prisoners or, or or accused people under the draconian laws like UAPA forcing into prison. And I think this again uh, puts them at heavy risk when prison themselves has. Have, have refused to, uh, to, to welcome new prisoners. And I think the judges who are playing a part into this, I think this is one of the foolish attempts to again put the lives of our respectable citizens and as well as respectable Indians beyond their stature and whatnot to an enormous amount of risk where we will produce uh, abysmal uh, 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 failure on part of uh, our, our administration, but as well as the lives that we are putting at risk. Thank you. Um, thank you, Suraj, uh, for that very interesting kind of analysis of the pandemic and what is happening. Um, again, looking from an Ambedkarite lens, uh, I just wanted to again bring out something which uh, Anu also mentioned about uh, invisibilization, right? And that is something which we uh, talk about at various levels, whether it is uh, invisibilization of uh, caste for the for the dominant groups and hypervisibilization for um, the marginalized caste uh, or the invisibilization in the way you and Anu uh, spoke about in terms of a kind of an invisible barbed wire, right? That kind of uh, doesn't allow you to, uh, to, to become socially, economically mobile or to even have a certain sense of uh, uh, in, like just meeting the other, right? Meeting each other, uh, humanizing each other. And the danger, as you said correctly, is that there will be more uh, legitimacy or justification for such practices, which ideally should go the other way. Ideally, after the this kind of uh, social isolation, people should come out and um, break out of these boundaries even more. But yeah, the danger is actually it may go the other way, where uh, uh, these kind of uh, distancing, social distancing, uh, untouchability practices may get new kinds of legitimization. And that's something which we should really uh, find a way to counter it and say that, okay, uh, for pandemic, we need physical distancing uh, in a very pragmatic sense, but that doesn't mean it gets a, it's, it gets a existing ontological justification in some way, right? which is what kind of Brahminism tries to bring. Uh, all right, thank you so much, Suraj. Uh, I'll now invite uh, Professor Valerian to um, speak for um, another 12 to 15 minutes, and then we will have a more general discussion um, where uh, the panelists will respond to each other. And we will also try to bring in uh, the questions that have been coming in through the discussion. 
uh, Professor Valerian. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and listen to both Anupama and Suraj. Uh, let me flag off by uh, saying that the frame through which I look at Ambedkar is uh, made of four major elements. Most of the commentators on Ambedkar, starting from Chakravarti, Rajgopala Achari, Kasturi Ranga, uh, Santanam, or even uh, Sarvopalli Gopa, term Baba Sahib Ambedkar as the leader of the untouchables. Even EMS Nambutri part does that in the freedom struggle. Of course, Baba Sahib Ambedkar was the leader of the untouchables. And he saw a large amount of problems through the lens of the untouchables. But seeing problems through the lens of the untouchables is also seeing the problems through the lens of humanity. That is through the lens of everyone. But there are three other elements within the frame of Baba Sahib Ambedkar, which I think are very, very significant. That is the second one is uh, Ambedkar is a cosmopolitan intellectual. Ambedkar interacted with all the gripping ideas of his time, took his stance against most of the people, not merely in India, but across the world, and was also part of a vibrant public culture of the first half of the 20th century. And uh, the second, uh, the third element is, of course, Ambedkar developed a theory of social practice, which addressed and connected these ideas and stances to the conditions in India, particularly to the conditions of the untouchables and the Adivasis. But, the, and here I come to the fourth element, but it is also important for us that Baba Sahib Ambedkar was constantly attending to the larger problems of the world, be it fascism, be it colonialism, be it racism, particularly issues of slavery and marginalities all over the world, and the growing inequality across the world. So if there is someone who is entitled to be a global scholar, global intellectual from the South, I feel it is Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And it is a legitimate matter of pride to all of us who are either born in the community that Baba Sahib was born into, or those of us who have studied and have admiration for Baba Sahib Ambedkar, that we have in him a person who can be an inspiring example, not merely for us in India, but all across the world, particularly for the marginalized sections. Let me come to the second issue that I want to flag off. The second issue is what do I think are some of the, some of the vexing problems of our times? Of course, the pandemic is with us, but as Suraj was pointing out, pandemic actually bears heavily on people who are otherwise marginalized. And the scenes that we have seen of millions of people trudging on roads that were leading nowhere is, is 
one of the great sides of marginality that we have seen. But we live in a world of widening social and economic inequalities. We live in a world where democracy has increasingly become a label and is thinning out and being replaced by more so populism. We, have, we live in a world where representation does not, no longer means what it is, but is, has become largely a matter of stamping approval for interests and lobbies that people do not know about. And we see all over the world growing genocide and a widening gulf between the human and the nature. I feel that Baba Sahib Ambedkar addresses some of these issues quite centrally. And it is important for us to do a, a bit of uh, uh, discussion or uh, uh, textual criticism by which we can tease out uh, ideas from Baba Sahib Ambedkar and see how some of these problems that he attends to. Let me come to the third part where I, where I'm going to discuss briefly uh, the responses that Baba Sahib Ambedkar makes. And I also want to point out at the end some of the lacunae in his response. The first one is uh, the way um, Baba Sahib Ambedkar handles the notion of Swaraj. Swaraj as self-rule. Swaraj as people who take their destiny in their own hands. Swaraj, which means people's lives are not commandeered by forces which are external to them, but they actually begin to decide what are their significant priorities. Baba Sahib Ambedkar became very, very critical of the kind of notion of Swaraj that was in the public domain in India and begins to say that there is no Swaraj unless the last man gets Swaraj, and not merely the last man, but the communities to which the last man belongs also begin to be equal to others. I'm sure that this addresses issues in India, as well as in the rest of the world. And he becomes the spokesperson of the large marginalized world. The second one is the way Baba Sahib Ambedkar looks at the issue of democracy. He makes a sharp distinction between elections and democracy. While elections are the tools, what one actually begins to strive for is democracy rather than elections becoming the replica of democracy in India or elsewhere in the world. This is the fundamental difference between somebody like Joseph Schumpeter, who in a book called Capitalism, Socialism and Democracy, which probably Baba Sahib Ambedkar had read, had argued that elections become the ultimate criteria of democracy. And Baba Sahib Ambedkar directly disagreed with that argument which came to be foisted. Increasingly, people think that uh, uh, the existence of elections is the criterion of democracy in India. And the verdict that comes out from elections is the verdict of democracy. Baba Sahib Ambedkar could not have disagreed more. He argued, and I'm quoting him, it is uh, not 
elections that matter to us, what matters to us is we becoming lawmakers. A democracy is the one where people rule themselves. And Baba Sahib Ambedkar thought that eventually the situation should be that where people come to rule themselves rather than rely upon external agencies to conduct their own rule. Now here comes the crunch. The crunch is the idea of representation that Baba Sahib Ambedkar proposed. There are two aspects to the idea of representation that he puts before us. He argues that of course representation should be representation of interests and representation of views and positions. But representation is also personal representation because people should actually feel when you go back home that this is our person, this is our representative, and they need to actually begin to have trust in the system. And the concept of trust is something which is central to legitimacy of power in Baba Sahib Ambedkar. The third idea that I want to come to is the idea of constitutional democracy or constitutionalism that Baba Sahib Ambedkar proposes. And the way he connects the idea of constitution, constitutionalism and constitutional democracy to the wider, more encompassing idea of democracy as such. For Baba Sahib Ambedkar, constitutionalism involves two aspects. The first is the relationship between the citizen and public authority. And the second one is the relation between the citizen and the citizen community at large. And therefore, constitutionalism is a triangle. First, there is the citizen, one, one side of the triangle. Then, of course, there is the public authority or call it state, whatever you want to call it. And of course, there is the community or society at large. Now, as citizens, we need to be governed by rule of law. And we need to have our rights. And we need to have, uh, we need to have our opportunities. And state plays a major role in terms of enabling citizens to have their rights, to have their liberties, and to have their equalities. Now, let's remember that Baba Sahib Ambedkar argued that liberty for him meant not absence of restraint, but a positive power or capacity of making oneself what one wants to be. And without liberty, one cannot be what one wants to be. And uh, the state also need to ensure that there is an egalitarian plateau. Now, equality for Baba Sahib Ambedkar is not merely equality before law or equality of opportunities, but everyone being treated as equal or if I want to put it like this, equality of consideration. State therefore is not merely providing a level playing field, which it has to, but state also need to provide safeguards by which those obstacles which prevent people from coming over to the level playing field could be removed. And these safeguards, what we call in India as reservation policies, are absolutely important, Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And they are not merely rights. They are a different order of provisions. 
And these provisions are for people who are different and marginalized. And Baba Sahib Ambedkar thought that difference and marginalization eventually is the stronger, stronger conclusion for minorities rather than merely religious or cultural differences. So constitutionalism is not merely a relationship between citizen and public authority, but among citizens themselves. And citizens need to treat other citizens as equal and as free. And to the extent that social and economic structures exist, which prevent people from doing that, to that extent, you can't be a citizen. And therefore, state has a positive role to play as far as intervening in the relationship between citizens and citizen community is concerned. Baba Sahib makes that distinction between political democracy and social democracy to indicate that. And if you do not have social democracy, you cannot probably have political democracy for a very long time. A situation that we are confronting in India, but also probably elsewhere in the world, countries like Brazil, whose president we invited as the chief guest on the Republic Day this year. And the last couple of points that I want to make. Baba Sahib Ambedkar thought that constitutionalism, the constitutional democracy is basically weak. It is weak not merely because there is no social democracy, but it is weak because political democracy can be trumped by power existing at, at various levels of the society and the elite can take over and uh, a sect, a group, a dominant class can always begin to rule in the name of public authority when they are actually protecting partisan interests. So how do we actually break through this particular conundrum? Baba Sahib Ambedkar thought that the only way that we can break through this conundrum is by cultivating a particular virtue outside the domain of political power. And that virtue can be cultivated only in the larger plane of the society. He called it as morality. Now, I think we need to distinguish between the kind of moralisms that are being paraded across the country. And Sura just mentioned about how religious leaders of all hues in India are parading moralisms today that often border on superstitions. <laughs> Morality is a product of a particular kind. It's a product of treating people with dignity and enabling people to reach out to their best levels. In fact, he defined the telos of human beings as perfection that people seek perfection and therefore society and state or public authority should come together to enable people to reach the best of their levels. Buddhism for Baba Sahib Ambedkar is not a religion in the traditional way that we understand a religion. In fact, the Buddha and his Dhamma, if anything, it is a very strong critique of existing Buddhisms. Baba Sahib Ambedkar begins to argue that the teachings of the Buddha are teachings of how one actually begins to regard others and how does one begin to relate to others. And, uh, and there is a term that he often uses, particularly in the context of constitutionalism, 
that is constitutional morality. Hmm. How does one understand constitutional morality? For Baba Sahib Ambedkar, constitutional morality is the morality that, uh, that is embedded within the constitutional uh, logic of India, constitutional reasoning of India, which is partly embedded in the constitutional document, but there is a larger terrain of public reasoning that actually begins to work out in terms of constitutional morality. Constitutional morality therefore involves how we actually begin to treat others, how do we begin to regard others, what kind of opportunities and liberties everyone else should have, and what are our responsibilities in terms of auditing not merely power of the state, but power of social structures around us. Now he connects this idea of constitutional morality to the kind of morality the Buddha began to argue. Therefore, eventually for Baba Sahib Ambedkar, the destiny becomes constitutional morality, but destiny towards constitutional morality is also our journey to learn at the feet of the Buddha. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Valerian. That was a very, you can say, a, a, a broad canvas that you have put for all the different ideas of uh, Ambedkar that we can actually draw from today. Uh, so uh, when you spoke about um, his his way of thinking about Swaraj for the last person and for the most marginalized community, um, uh, democracy as not mere elections uh, and not <clears throat> not thinking that we are uh, we are good enough if if we are able to have just free and fair elections. There is much more to it, uh, and that's where you get into the constitutional aspect of uh, of uh, of everyday life, which is not just a document that. Um, is to be interpreted by the judges or by uh, state and public officials, but also creates a relationship uh, between different citizens. And uh, this is something which I think all three of you have spoken. Uh, Baba Saab also um, wrote about this extensively that the, uh, that the most anti-national uh, thing in India uh, is uh, basically caste and patriarchy, right? So uh, if we are not able to uh, up, uproot this kind of Brahmanism that pro provides the uh, ground for uh, caste and patriarchy, then what is the kind of uh, nationalism or constitutionalism that we can ever uh, think of building in this country, right? And, uh, and that's what we have seen in some ways that um, without, without that effort of building that constitutional morality, without that effort of uh, killing or annihilating that anti-national spirit uh, in all of us, uh, we we are really not progressing anywhere in becoming a nation, right? So I'll uh, open up uh, the conversation for the panelists to respond to what uh, they have heard from each other, uh, to draw upon other things that all of you have written in past, and kind of uh, again, uh, kind of make make us uh, think through some of these things that have been raised by the three of you. Uh, in the meantime, I will uh, look at the question and answers and try to collect it and bring it to you. And then we can uh, discuss that as well. Uh, yeah, so please feel free to unmute yourself, any of the panelists and uh, respond to the things that um, you have spoken or you have heard uh, from other panelists or the question and answers. Yeah, question. Uh, Professor Anupama, can I request you to uh, respond to the things that uh, both Valerian and Suraj have uh, raised and connecting it to your own, uh, uh, what you said about uh, equality of outcomes, uh, the mass intellectuality, uh, the invisibilization that is happening? Um, sure, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, there's a couple of things that came up in, in both what Suraj mentioned and um, Professor Rodriguez mentioned. One, I think, is, is this very big question, I think, for everybody who is engaging with Ambedkar's writings and thought. 
And this is, you know, uh, in what ways do we think about uh, Ambedkar indeed as a, a um, global intellectual, as somebody who is actually a political philosopher, a thinker of radical democracy. And indeed, if one starts to engage with Ambedkar as a thinker, then one both has to situate him in his own time, think about the kinds of uh, political problems, the world that he was responding to. But as well, I think, you know, one wants to think about the, the, the kind of enormous reach of Ambedkar, his inaugural, right? He's actually imagining and producing responses to particular questions that are both of his time, but have a kind of relevance and a reach that extends well beyond that. And so one, I think is, you know, we want to, so, so one aspect of this is, you know, uh, how do we think about Ambedkar as a political philosopher, as a thinker? And that means that, you know, we have to also uh, reconsider the extent to which then we want to operationalize Ambedkar, right? So there are certain things that Ambedkar can help us think about. There are other ways in which we use the example of Ambedkar's insurgence to think beyond it. And so, you know, we, we, we want to, it seems to me, think about Ambedkar in his time, but also, you know, the direct relevance that he may have for us. But also, how do we want to think about him uh, in terms of a much, much broader project of intellectual history, the history of ideas? And it seems to me that there is a real tension here, and we have to um, acknowledge this. And I know that uh, both, I think, uh, Professor Rodriguez and Suraj have also indicated and grappled with this issue in their own work. So that, it seems to me, is something that we want to really think about. Um, the second, then, if we do think about Ambedkar, the thinker, we can come to the, the question of his policy and his practice. One of the interesting things, of course, about Ambedkar is that he is, um, his thought in many ways uh, is in conversation with, but also exceeds what he's doing on the ground. So what we see Ambedkar across the context of his time doing is coming up with a series of political experiments, right, that he puts into place. How do you actually imagine and how do you enfranchise an invisible minority? This is his question for the defense classes. He goes to the Southborough Commission, he goes to the Simon Commission, even as it's being boycotted by nationalists and indeed the Simon Commission is boycotted by the Muslim League, right? And so the ways in which he begins to use every opening that's available to him, right, in the context of late colonialism, uh, to put in place these, these political experiments, new ways of imagining precisely this question of a more capacious equality, one that's not merely formal, but it also has to begin with formal equality in a context where you don't have it. So it seems to me that, you know, there's, uh, so I just wanted to begin by marking uh, that kind of a, a divergence perhaps, and a, a very rich conversation I think that can be had uh, from within the domain of Ambedkar studies. And one of the things that we've not really, it seems to me, managed to do, and I'll use the example of African-American thought and philosophers of race and so forth that I began with as well, you can think about an, a tradition of African-American political thought where there's a series of, you know, internal debates, you know, what is Douglas's relationship to Du Bois? Where is Du Bois in relationship to the Harlem Renaissance, right? And so on and so forth. We're still coming into that space in the study of Ambedkar, it seems to me. And so I'd really like to mark that. Um, the second you asked about the question of, of the constitution and constitutionalism, and I'll, I'll sort of end by noting that um, there is a real difference between the moment that Ambedkar was working in, um, where indeed, you know, his imaginations of democracy, but also the thinking of the constitution is really occurring at a moment of a kind of political opening. And I think we should be good historians and think about the moment now. Suraj also brought this up and Suraj brought, brought this up in terms of thinking about uh, late capitalism, if you will, and the ways in which late capitalism and Hindu nationalism and Hindutva has altered the broader historical terrain. Um, and so maybe I'll sort of, you know, open with that and, and invite, you know, conversation with my colleagues and then can come back and say a few more specific things. Uh, but it seems to me that the moment that we're in now, the moment of authoritarian populism, indeed the loss in a sense of rich representation, thick representation, 
which Ambedkar seeks to put in place, means that we actually have to rethink the very project of what constitutional morality, indeed what the constitution can be in our time, given the massive assault on constitutional thinking itself. Right? So where are the people? How do we think popular sovereignty? What are the modes and the mechanisms for making thick democracy possible? Right? So that it is socially just, it's economically equitable, and it actually puts in place a robust notion of political representation, all of which actually are lost. Whereas the moment that Ambedkar and the anti-colonial thinkers are coming into is a moment actually of a kind of possibility. Right? That's why you have the rich arguments with you know, the communists, you have a rich argument with uh, you know, in thoughts on Pakistan and in, partition, in the partition of India, the 40 and 45 texts, Ambedkar is engaging every question on the ground, territorial partition, the question of political economy, the question of democratic representation, the question first uh, and fundamentally on something that you brought up as seen of the question of the relationship between caste and patriarchy, sexual and social reproduction. And that indeed is, is something that we've lost, you know, we've, we've not really talked about enough perhaps in this conversation and we might want to come back to. Yeah, uh, thank you, Anu, uh, for that kind of uh, going back to some of the important kind, uh, concepts that uh, Babsa engaged with. And like, like I think Professor Valerian was also saying, he engaged with every question that was coming up that in that times and didn't really kind of uh, focus as if that his interest is only one thing and he will not engage with everything else that is going on. He kind of responded to everything. And a uh, few of the questions are around that that we have received. Uh, I don't know if you want to uh, build on it. Um, so uh, questions on uh, uh, Ambedkar's own engagement with socialism and uh, Buddhism and his kind of move between that Marx and Buddha, uh, his understanding of how even uh, Nehru's, Nehruvian socialism kind of worked, whether that was something that he uh, agreed with, what was his uh, problems with it. And then obviously uh, a very oft repeating question about uh, Pakistan and the, and the whole notion of Muslim brotherhood, whether it extends beyond uh, uh, the, uh, the Islamic community to others uh, for, for a possibility of an extended kind of fraternity, or is it again narrowly uh, uh, limited to that? Um, so these are the questions that are coming up. I also wanted, uh, maybe any of you can respond to this uh, dilemma as well, that at one level, Suraj is saying, that privatization of health, privatization of public distribution and uh, other kind of education, all of this is highly problematic in the way it kind of leaves out most marginalized communities. But when uh, we look at the state itself and the state machinery, whether it is judiciary, whether it is um, um, other yeah, bureaucracy or politicians, all of that has also seemed to be appropriated uh, in, in the larger kind of Brahminical logic. So uh, is, it, is it both like uh, we are stuck between a rock and a hard place that at one we, we get into privatization, which is uh, the neoliberal logic kind of uh, completely excludes marginal communities, or you try to come back to public systems, but public systems are really uh, not, not, not doing the job that we, we aim to do it or what constitution kind of uh, aims to uh, have with the public. So when public itself has been appropriate, so where are we in this in this dilemma also? If any of you wants to respond to these questions, yeah. 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 Uh, these are great questions. But let me make uh, a comments. Uh, one on the responses of uh, Anupama. And We're second, not able to hear you very clearly, Professor Valerian. Uh, I will make a couple of comments. Uh, one on um, uh, Anupama's very interesting three comments and the kind two questions that you have thrown out, but also on her presentation, because 
I found her presentation very fascinating. Uh, now, Ambedkar as a political philosopher is a very interesting thing. A philosopher, I don't think Pars is their name as a philosopher. You know, a philosopher handles ideas, concepts, very conscious about the methodology of how he pursues them and builds up arguments in the process. To that extent, Ambedkar handles ideas, connects those ideas, engages with his interlocutors, and is reflectively conscious about the kind of questions that he is pursuing. The notion of radical democracy, which I think Ambedkar was privy to, is an idea which goes back quite historically, quite in the past. In the 1848 and 1850 revolutions in Europe, when Marx, in a series of articles in New Renice Zeto, argues that the workers would not be able to take over power, the best option before the workers is to ensure greater and greater possibility of expanding democracy and making a space for themselves. Baba Sahib Ambedkar definitely connects himself to an idea of this kind, either directly or through the instrumentalities that, are, that were available to him, intellectual instrumentalities that were available to him and begins to argue that constitutional democracy is not an end in itself. Constitutional democracy is a means, and therefore the criteria of constitutional democracy is not looking backward to five-year elections, but looking forward to what extent we have been able to strengthen democracy rather than for constitutional Definitely, Baba Sahib Ambedkar was against legalism. In a country like India, he thought that furthering the democratic project is also furthering the project of socialism. And here I'm going to connect to, connect to the two questions that you, you raised. The first one is, of course, with regard to Ambedkar's socialism. Ambedkar was very close to John Dewey. All of us know Ambedkar also was very close to the Fabian school. He studied uh, under the guidance of several great luminaries of the Fabian school. And socialism, therefore, of a particular variant of socialism, is part of the thinking of Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Now, today we are accustomed to hear a particular notion of the state as the embodiment of sovereignty. But Ambedkar thought of the state in a very different way. Ambedkar thought of the state as a public authority, Prabhutva in Indian words, as a public authority that can be enabling, enabling citizens in general and enabling to the society by and large, society as a whole, by removing various kinds of obstacles that are possible. In Pakistan or Partition of India and its uh, you know, earlier text, Thoughts on Pakistan, Baba Sahib Ambedkar definitely invokes a kind of notion of brotherhood that is there among Muslims. And he begins to give a lot of examples to that effect, including from Muhammad Ali and Shaukat Ali's writing. But for Ambedkar, whether you are going to include another community within the fold of democracy or not, is an exercise between the communities, and the majority plays a major role in this process. Baba Sahib Ambedkar thought that the Congress has the greater responsibility 
of reaching out to the Muslim League and getting them involved in the conversation. Now, this is not an argument that he makes merely in Pakistan or Pakistan of India, but he repeats this argument on 17 December 1946 and begins to say that we would be making a big mistake if Muslim League is going to be kept out of the constituent assembly. So democracy does not have fixed boundaries. Let us not talk about democracy as we experience it today. For Ambedkar, democracy's boundaries are flexible. Boundaries of constitutional democracy are flexible. And we need to constantly begin to see the pragmatics of politics to expand constitutional democracy in the direction of democracy. There are communities in India and definitely Muslims have a kind of relationship across them, across them, which is, which one can say in several ways different from the relations between other community members. But it is the responsibility of other members, if they are part of democracy, to see that others are included within the fold of democracy and take them along. But what we are seeing, at least in our country, is to see that they are excluded rather than being included. And this is the first attempt that any constitutional democracy has to do. Now, I have spoken longer, but the last question I want to throw up to Anupama, that is uh, with regard to globalization that she mentioned. There are people today who are arguing that the pandemic has set into motion a process wherein nation states are falling back upon themselves rather than breaking boundaries allowing people to reach out to others. What would be the position that Anupama would take? Should we try to strengthen nationalism or should we actually begin to reach out to greater global connectivity uh, in the kind of situation that exists? But that situation could be with regard to other issues as well. Uh, thank you, Professor Vellelian. Suraj, do you want to respond to any of the questions that have emerged um, from how Anupama and Valerian responded? Uh, yeah, I think. I think both of them, you know, I mean, in, in a way, wrestling through the, the, the political spectrum of how Ambedkar kind of the canvas of Ambedkar is, is, is presented to us. And I think it's a very enriching conversation. I just wish they keep continues for a longer time. Um, uh, I mean, I mean my, my two cents on this, or rather two points, <laughs> which each cent belongs to one point, uh, is we, I, I think the... the one is conflicted Ambedkar and one is, you know, uh, 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 conflicted Ambedkar. And I think this is this is way uh, we sometimes uh, get lost into understanding the, you know, the crux. Or we, we don't even have to go to the crux. We just have to get to the evolutionary aspects of Ambedkar. And I think uh, one, of course, is the uh, culmination of the Buddha. And, you know, and uh, Professor Rodriguez has pointed out the constitutional morality is actually Ambedkar's way of looking at Buddha. And, and, and how he kind of, you know, but, uh, and, but, but Buddha is so central to his thinking, especially uh, when he, uh, 19, uh, mid 1945 onwards, where whenever he's describing, uh, let's say parliamentary democracy, when he's describing communism, when he's describing a uh, constitutionalism, he is giving examples of Buddhism. He's giving the examples uh, from the, from the Jataka, uh, from the tales, from the experiences of Buddha. And, and, and here, uh, what happens is the, the Buddha as, as a, as a, as a political pragmatist, some, someone you know, uh, who, could, who, could, who could engage in political questions, like the way we have seen in the Abrahamic religious context where Jesus could be a political, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a political figure. Uh, 
um, like also uh, the prophet, I mean, not, not with, with the prophet Muhammad, but with Jesus, as we see, uh, it, it kind of comes out as someone who is, who is managing not only the affairs of the state, but also uh, the eternal uh, versus what is the, the, the so-called non-divine aspects of, of this. And Ambedkar is very effectively kind of drawing on one of those experiences where he is very much spiritually rooted, yet his dynamism is, is sharp in the sense that he is not losing the sight of his critique that has to do with the, the, the caste spectrum. Now, to understand Buddha in the Indian context is, is actually somehow we have lost and Buddha is someone you know who could who could who could engage in political fights, for example, or or who could who could go beyond meditation, you know, uh, the 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 kind of uh, formulation of Buddha. Ambedkar really effectively matures that, you know, and 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 his libraries of the books on Ambedkar's, and you know, from 1930s he's been introduced to Buddhism by the Westerners, who are practicing Buddhism. They keep on visiting to him, exchanging notes on Buddhism. The Italians. Uh, Buddhists would come, or, or you know, and also the the Anglo world, uh, Buddhism kind of influences his thinking. Now, when we understand uh, the uh, the epitome of Buddhism or, or Ambedkar's kind of culmination into Buddhism, I think of constitutional uh, morality as a as a negotiating attempt of Ambedkar uh, to to discuss some issues that would not even have a purchase that would, people would otherwise not even hear up, <laughs> you know, because the society is so toxic and, and so, uh, uh, so confused uh, as to how to deal with the question of caste, but also the, the liberal spectrum, who, or, or sorry, the conservative spectrum who doesn't want to at all talk about it, but rather glorify it. Constitutional morality is where he is actually hinting to the thinking people, as well as people who would not stand his side uh, to, 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 to try to create a negotiating platform where we can at least come together and discuss the possibilities of, of that. And that's why the, the, the morality is, is very central to whatever you do. And for me, that comes from his ethic as being a Dalit, because the Dalit morality is very strong in the sense of presenting itself as a body that is willing to negotiate, but also willing to stand against anything that would come, uh, that, would, that, would, that would harm the forces of nature. And within his personal self, he is also inheriting the great values of his own history as a mahar, but also his own, you know, his embodiment of, of, of what a Dalit means in a wretched caste society. So being a Dalit is not an answer to the caste society, but it is, it is rather a, a, a pole or it is rather a milestone when one, one, one needs to reach to. Ambedkar very effectively brings that aspect to, 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 to be a radical Democrat in the sense of uh, not negotiating, uh, so not giving up the rights he has negotiated, but yet he has to manage, he has to work uh, in, 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 uh, you know, in, in, in constant, almost like when we see the uh, Gandhi fast, and then of course there's a compromises and there's negotiations. So Ambedkar's life could be analyzed through the kind of negotiations he does, the kind of arbitrations he is involved in and whatever he gets, he kind of brings in there. And I, and I think within that scope, we can, we can see how Ambedkar plays a part uh, in, in imparting the values uh, which go beyond the dossier of constitution or beyond the dossier of Indian Republic, the way we understand today. Could I, could I come in briefly? Yeah, sure, you... sure. Yeah. 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 No, I wanted to to come in on some uh, on a couple of things that that Suraj has said as well. Um, one, I think, is, is the question of you know um, sort of Buddhism, and 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 sort of the radicality of Buddhism. And for Ambedkar, I think this is twofold. One, I think, is certainly the ways in which um, Suraj, I think, very importantly, and he started his conversation um, and, and his notes uh, when he presented by thinking about corporeality and materiality, right? And I think that was very, very important and, and, and really quite keen because the question of the body, the question of stigma, and the question of, of, of the body indeed as a kind of bearer as it were, of, of an entire history of caste, including the ways in which, uh, you know, Ambedkar comes to writing what I would call a kind of doubled history of Buddhism. One is that he wants to see Buddhism as real historical force. And this mm. is where 
uh, you know, Ambedkar is relying on the material of his time, and we may not want to understand the history of Buddhism in that way. I would actually challenge that, his use of uh, anthropology in other instances of a particular kind of history and so forth, is itself, uh, it's polemical, one might say. Right? So one might, you know, push against some of the modes uh, of, of historicization that he engages in. But be that as it may, what Ambedkar wants to do is to present Buddhism as real historical force on the subcontinent. And then I think the ways in which uh, Suraj is bringing up the question of a kind of ethical remaking of the self, right? So Buddhism then becomes something um, that, is, that is part and par parcel of, of the way in which Ambedkar thinks about ethics, right? And the project of a kind of ethicization and it's the ethicization of religion what he, you know, argues is impossible in Hinduism that he all, you know, that he actually kind of effects, if you will, in the reading of Buddhism. So I think that doubled notion of Buddhism is some, um, and it's worth thinking about, and it comes back to Professor Rodriguez's point as well, uh, you know, because he brought up the question of uh, thoughts on Pakistan and then uh, Pakistan or the partition of India. What Ambedkar does when he moves in the later texts to thinking about millennial history is to actually give to Hinduism, Quranic Hinduism, a very small space on the historical landscape. And this I think is worth thinking about. Hinduism comes late. And indeed, you know, for him, the two major agons on the subcontinent are Buddhism and Islam, right? And each of these for, for Ambedkar, uh, present particular models of sovereignty, both sovereignty thought of, you know, vis-a-vis -vis state, but also it seems to me the question of Swaraj and, and of self-sovereignty, something that Professor Rodriguez brought up. And I think we do want to think about the ways in which, I mean, if we wanted to think about the relevance for today, that, you know, if we are actually able to minimize in some ways the history of Hinduism and see it as, you know, the kind of agon uh, within a broader millennial landscape, this might really ask us to do some other important work in, in you know, where we place, you know, Hindu majoritarianism today and so on and so forth. And bear in mind also that, you know, Ambedkar, when he's writing at that time, is responding to certainly someone like uh, Iqbal's uh, understanding of, of the place of South Asia for the broader sort of global kind of Islamic universality. But he has to deal with someone like Tilak, thinking about him as a Western Indian thinker. Tilak, who has written, you know, Arctic Home in the Vedas and who has gone back and rethought the argument about comparative philology to suggest that the Aryan home is actually in the Arctic and Indians are the bearers of that. Or the Akhand Bharat argument that Savarkar is putting in place. So the kind of geography, as it were, of the subcontinent is really open to question in the 20s and the 30s um, at the moment that Ambedkar is writing. And he has to find an interesting place in that. The other, and I'm also responding to a couple of questions. I'm trying to pull on a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, there's another one about, and a few people have asked about sort of Ambedkar as a global thinker, but also what's Indian about Ambedkar as an Indian political thinker, um, Shauna Rodriguez in particular. And, and one of the ways in which we may want to think about this, this relationship between the global Ambedkar and where he stands in the tradition of Indian political thought is I think, you know, if we go back and say, what is it that fundamentally Ambedkar ends up doing? I would suggest to you that what he does is to rethink the relationship between the social and the political. This goes back again to something that Professor Rodriguez was asking about the kind of uh, understanding or the elaboration of the radical democratic tradition. But it is the relationship, or if we go back and think about Marx and the Jewish question, it's the question of the relationship between the social and the political that's really at issue for modern political thought. And in that sense, Ambedkar has to be an Indian thinker because he has to think through the social conditions of caste and what it is that makes the Indian social distinctive and different. And there is where it seems to me his, his, his kind of remarkable uh, rethinking as it were of not just the history of caste and untouchability, but this kind of rewriting of Indian history on a kind of global and a millennial stage is something that we want to think about. This might be the place where the kind of the Indian in Ambedkar as it were really comes to play, which is the very distinctive 
localized, if you will, regional uh, or Indian, if you want, subcontinental ways in which Ambedkar reprises the relationship between the domain of the social and the domain of the political. And indeed, this is going to have deep consequence for his imagination of the constitution as actually a, a, a kind of document that, that he asks to do a lot of work. It performs the work of historic remediation or historical remediation, but it's also a proleptic document that must imagine the future as being different from the past. So this relationship between history and the past for Ambedkar is a very sticky place, right? Mm. And I don't think there's an easy response to how you know, he moves between you know, history and the future. That is also what makes him, it seems to me, a kind of Indian political thinker, if you will, distinguishes him from the tradition of uh, new liberalism, which he's certainly drawing on, uh, speaking of you know, Fabian socialism and others, uh, or even the kind of you know, French revolution or a certain kind of Marxian tradition of thinking radical democracy. I'll just bring a few more questions from the Q&A and I would like uh, any, any of you can pick them up and respond. So uh, yeah, there are many questions. We will not be able to answer all of them, but uh, uh, some themes that have come up. So one question uh, that has been asked in different ways is, uh, uh, why is the RSS and Hindutva project interested in Ambedkar in the first place? Like why will it be interested in some uh, in someone who is such a radical critique of Brahmanism and Hinduism, uh, and then to make efforts to appropriate him consistently over so long. And uh, one of the latest print uh, uh, videos on an uh, um, yeah on someone like from an RSS uh, trying to say that how Ambedkar's ideas were very close to um, the Hindutva ideas. So uh, why is this interest, and what is this uh, strategy, or the you can say a larger uh, tactic of appropriation that happens with the Brahmanism, Brahmanism systematically, right? And this is not happening just now, even the idea of uh, vegetarianism and all of that has been systematically appropriated from other traditions. So what is happening there? And if you can uh, speak about that. Uh, another uh, set of questions have been on, again, um, constitutional morality in some ways that how do we make the transformative document like a constitution to to be, uh, to be actually able to transform uh, social realities and not just get limited uh, by a certain kind of constitutional bench reading it and also not really uh, implementing it in many cases, um, which also connects to uh, the, an Ambedkar right future, right? As in how do we uh, look at doing, uh, like even, even the way uh, we have responded to pandemic it seems like we are unaware of that there is something called caste and patriarchy in India and uh, all of this, what we are doing will go and directly uh, attach onto that. So even when physical distancing is required, it's not that in, in, a, in a crisis like this, it's not required, but to really see what does that mean for most of the country to even think of physical distancing when we live in such close proximities, how do we respond to it? Is there is there a more located uh, way of responding to this pandemic rather than just some ideas that are floating and trying to implement without knowing that everything in India will take up the shape of the social realities that we live in, right? So uh, that is also uh, something important. Uh, um, yeah, if, if any of you want to respond to either of this, Though there are many more questions, I don't know if you would be able to take all of them. Yeah. Can you come in on the Hey, Professor Valerian, we are not uh, able to hear you very clearly. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now it's better. In the last, last 20 years or so, uh, several RSS intellectuals or intellectuals connected to RSS have produced 
excellent works if you look at the quality of the work on baba saheb ambedkar's writing and uh, i have been privy to listen to some of the speeches of some of these rss leaders and apparently it looks that they are extremely well informed speeches but if you look at them closely there are some things that clearly stand out one is attempting to other muslim and begin to pin the blame for partition largely on gandhi and nehru this is one the second one is to encompass dalits within squarely within the fold of uh, what is called larger hinduism it's not that baba saheb ambedkar always denied this there was there was a kind of relationship there and the strong denial comes only in the later stages hello yeah yeah we are here you can speak uh, the stronger denial comes only in the later stages but what has happened is the attempt by the rss to encompass hindus not merely in terms of larger societal networks but to create a thick bonds across hindus in which dalits are going to be included they have reached out selectively to certain sections of dalits by using sub castes among dalit communities and we have fairly the picture across the country today where if there were some sub castes associated with the congress the rss has gone to the others largely telling them look here what has the nehruian state has done to you and by promising them benefits they have attempted to reinforce divisions within the dalits while at the same time including dalits within the larger fold of hinduism and the success is obvious today the majority of uh, the members of the parliament in from the reserved constituencies belong to the bharatiya janata party and uh, uh, the data from the shaka show there is there is uh, a growing proportion of dalits boys young boys attending and becoming a member of the shakas so brahmanism wants to wants to tighten uh, the the boundaries of what we can say hinduism much more tightly and make it play on the global scene what was the attempt of baba saheb ambedkar either to question hinduism or to loosen out these boundaries so that both hinduism can be transformed it can be if it can be transformed and if it cannot be transformed the marginal sections particularly dalits have a way out to live a very different kind of life uh, so the for the for the brahminical uh, segment or for the rss the dalit question probably is the most important question they confront <laughs> and largely today they have become successful uh, now this is i think i would not like to ascribe all the blame on the present regime in india you have a state 
which came to be carved out on a logic which is far removed from the kind of reasoning that Baba Sahib Ambedkar puts forward. You cannot ask him to come and respond to questions or respond to problems which have been created by others. The Nehruvian state largely cultivated an extremely elitist mode of constitutional democracy in India. Yeah. And it has been to create a small segment within Dalits which are going to be co-opted within the larger elite in the country, a problem which Suraj has uh, brought out very well in past matters. And probably he has been attacked for pointing out that particular issue. But I think we need to rethink not merely the Brahminical project in India today, yes, we are, but we need to rethink the Nehruvian project as well, if we are going to take Baba Sahib Ambedkar seriously. And something that uh, uh, Anupama brought out, but incidentally, that is probably we need to question the kind of world that we have come to live today and the kind of fixities around which nations, communities are bounded together. And I feel that Baba Sahib Ambedkar offers us a space to question rigidified boundaries. And it's not a matter of going back, but it's a matter how we actually begin to go forward and think of this of a decent society. I think uh, I think uh, just to take a cue uh, and you know to kind of build on the argument. I think um, on the on the RSS project. I think one of the uh, successes of RSS was to Hinduize the Brahmins. And by, by doing that, what they did was to project a Hindu pan identity uh, while basically it continues to be a Brahmin run project. Uh, and, 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 and then at some point, some of the intermediary caste, especially within the twice born uh, fold, get a little access, but it's, it's, it's basically a very specific subcaste amongst uh, of the Brahmins that continue to uh, declare uh, their, their 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 vehement uh, uh, ruling on this country, and this and this, that's why we have to understand the historical origins and conflicts of the Brahmin community themselves, as to especially what what is peculiar about this Maharashtra's uh, Deshas or the Kharde Brahmins, as to why they have so much of a of 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 buying about about Hinduizing the entire India as opposed to let's say uh, a, a Namudri Brahmin. Or, or a Brahmin, even Sardesai Brahmins, uh, who who are also on the coast, and and so uh, instead of becoming it a Dalit question, we have to make it a Brahmin question, and once we subvert the analysis and methodological, uh, 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 you know, the, the deficiencies we have, then we might come to understand how then the 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 uh, the control of Brahmin on these important fields, almost like a Jewish question, but but in a in a in, in a sort of a para identity uh, that that it operates under uh, and 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 so if you look through it i mean why is rss interested or why rather i would say why are brahmins interested in in ambedkar because i mean as, as we see to 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 just invoke kanjiram the kind of pen thing right so if untouchables leave then it will break the whole the whole canon of hindu is failed it is the the hindu identity is alive because they are standing on the feet and throats of Dalits, Dalit workers, Dalit peasants, Dalit women, and Dalit professional class. And I think this very feet that they are on need to be strengthened. And for that to have, they are all massaging around that. They are going to all acupunctures and kind of Chinese therapies to make themselves feel more relevant in these times, right? And, 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 and now, if untouchables leave, what then we make of the Brahmin question? Because then, the, then, then, then it becomes a question between Kshatriyas and Baniyas, 
as to how do they then operate within the larger Hindu fold. For so long as there are Shudras and other lower castes and Muslims to uh, otherize the internal problems, RSS will continue to to make uh, to 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 have this. And so they want to. They are interested in Ambedkar and Ambedkar's practice and and theory because they want untouchables. They want to retain untouchability. Without untouchability or without untouchables existing, the Hindu as an identity, Hindu as a culture and religion will cease to exist. So it is a desperate attempt to continue uh, the oppression of a community that then continues to be degenerated as an untouchable. Second is Ambed, now the attack on Ambedkar. So this is how one is appropriate and second is attack. How do you attack Ambedkar? You don't attack Ambedkar directly, but you attack Ambedkar through the left excuses, through the uses, through the, through the, through the left. Uh, so today, uh, any Dalit raising a voice could be Naxal, could be Maoist, or could be a sympathizer of whatnot ideologies that are ascribing to the left. So many Dalit intellectuals who stand against the state or any Dalit ideologies or people even who are fighting for the rights of, let's say, Dalits and Adivasis who might not be Dalit themselves, are now considered the left uh, uh, internal threats. So this is how the attack on Ambedkar simultaneously happens without utilizing the name of Ambedkar. And silently, these very forces then sponsor the anti-Dalit movements that are happening on the ground, be it Bajrang Dal, be it all that kind of uh, uh, various kind of animal uh, senas they have, and, and, and all these vigilante groups that operate so they operate on rural and as well as they operate in urban. In urban, they are anti-reservationists. These are the people who want to call out the merit argument and you know, kind of dis, uh, discourage and disparage a Dalit student, a Dalit working person, a Dalit professional who is operating. On rural areas, we know Karam Chedu, we know Chinduru, we know, uh, you know, we, 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 we just have far many Kairlanjis and, and, and more incidents. And recently, 11 year old, 11th science student in Rajasthan was raped as she was taking the lunch to her uh, family uh, and, and then she was killed. So that's the rural uh, level of, of looking at these issues. And, and, and it becomes a very interesting thing that the central problem of RSS is not Muslim. The central problem of RSS is to retain untouchability. And in order to retain untouchability, they need divergence and they, they don't need to conflict directly with untouchables per se, because of course of this electoral democracy, now they have to suck it up. And for them to suck it up, they have to present a facade and what they have done is they have then find out Muslims or Christians or any of these other forms of external quote unquote forces to blame. The second part I was the, on the pandemic because it's on the closing. Uh, see in, in Indian, in, 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 like in America, the, the, the death rate of let's say in the pandemic is, is disproportionately the black people and now it's increasing to the Native Americans. Now. In India, we don't have a data of how many Dalits and Adivasis have died of COVID. There is no, there is no, we don't know their figures. Second is the accessibility of health. How many Dalits and Adivasis have regular access to health? Pre-pandemic or even in pandemic? I think that's, that, that data needs to become, you know, because that's the central problem. And the third, and I think which is, which is very essential to, uh, to understanding how this pandemic kind of takes place in its own avatar is the uh, formulation of the problem, not in the sense of death rates or not only in the sense of access, but to what are the inherent uh, 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 biologies within the Dalit or Adivasi bodies that are vulnerable to such kind of disease. Maybe it's, it could be pandemic or not, but we don't know how a Dalit body reacts like we know black bodies in America are prone to this because of certain health issues that have been inherited for a long time. And I think there is a significant amount of research. When it comes to Dalit and Adivasis, these people who are testing, they will test on Dalits and Adivasis in slums and all kinds of areas and all this thing. But we don't have anything on, on, on that spectrum. Finally, within the pandemic spec, uh, the, the whole debate, uh, the sanitation workers are you know, somehow not in the middle class consciousness. They don't even get recognized, and and we all have we all have that that uh, that, that apathy, which is basically uh, not you know uh, this is very ap type of apathy, the ap politics. I will clean my own house, but I will not clean the the neighborhood kind of apathy, uh, and 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 this apathy 
what it legitimizes is the work of sanitation workers. Now, people would congratulate sanitation worker. They have not done yet, but they'll congratulate. And this will be a jokes on you kind of clap because what we do is essentially is promote the kind of humiliating caste-based profession that has been legitimized by the Modi government and the previous governments to very much Professor Rodriguez's point about through, through a structural state statism that has given to it. Are we considered now, and this is what I proposed, I said uh, sanitation workers right now, you know, the children should get foreign education, uh, 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 whatever children they have, they should get a permanent house and all the facilities that middle class are unable to do, whatever access middle class right now has, should rightfully go to sanitation workers and middle class should contributing into that. If your children are going to study in Colombia and Harvard, I think it's a, it's it's now the focus that we should through through the pandemic maybe we should provide a solution through these problems and of course that's where then you know I am thinking maybe because of these facilities middle class will start doing sanitation work but again that's just my rhetoric. We'll have uh, closing comments now from uh, all our panelists. I think uh, Suraj has really kind of summed it up well. Um, uh, Professor Valerian and Anupama, I would like them to also um, provide their closing comments. Uh, again, looking at the, um, all the questions that have come, all the different points that uh, all of you have raised very interestingly, um, any kind of uh, ways to kind of understand this and then also work on the present and as well going further uh, as some of the uh, audience members have asked that, yeah. Can I come in now for my closing comments? Uh, uh, there are three issues by way of conclusion that I want to suggest. The case of the pandemic has shown us the depth of the marginality of large sections of Indians and particularly the way they live in the, in the peri-urban areas of the cities and their dissociation from their own families and their, their yearning to reach out to their families. Because that family becomes a small space where you are recognized as a human being, and then there is some amount of dignity that you can assume to yourself. While our urban sprawls do not provide that at all. So if there is one issue that the pandemic has highlighted, is the depth of marginality that India still harbors. And we need to assign responsibility for this marginality. It could be social forces. We have named some of them. It could be Indian state. I think Indian state has largely been unaccountable to the lives of its own people and basically has been a state serving us a small group of interests. And over the years, this gulf has widened. This is one, I think pandemic puts this question on the agenda straight. The second thing I just want to put across is uh, that Baba Sahib Ambedkar's reach today is global. That this conversation is taking place uh, but I'm speaking to someone sitting in Harvard and somebody else in, in New York and, and you sitting there in uh, Bangalore itself shows the reach of Ambedkar to new spaces. That reach has been largely new logistic kind of reach. That is a reach where we begin to praise Ambedkar, we begin to think, like I have mentioned, that probably Ambedkar is one of the great 
scholar of the South that we have. But I think we need to engage with Baba Sahib Ambedkar much more critically. Something which uh, I think Anupama brought out in her, in her presentation. That Ambedkar does provide us political and social space and intellectual energies. But there are also a you know, large force in the argument uh, in, in certain places, like the question of how do we actually begin to translate constitutional morality into reality? At the most, at least to my knowledge, I can go and say, you know, Baba Sahib Ambedkar did emphasize on critical education. He spoke of the significance of organization, and he spoke of the significance of agitation. But are they enough today in our context, you know, when people are increasingly being doctored in ways rather than begin to think for themselves and begin to combine and develop assemblage, which could be not merely strengthening but also challenging authority and keeping the system accountable. The third thing that I want to say is you know, salutes to the Dalit constituency. Uh, I have been reaching out to Baba Sahib Ambedkar for my own academic reasons for the last 30 years. But Dalits have kept Baba Sahib Ambedkar alive when people were not prepared to touch Baba Sahib Ambedkar. And they have connected their experiences to the arguments and ideas that Baba Sahib Ambedkar has made. I don't think we should minimize this large Dalit constituency that has precipitated in India over the years. Personally, I think it is the most vibrant, united constituency we have. There might be internal cleavages within this constituency, but there is also a conversation that continuously goes within this constituency. Now, this is a great thing that we have had. There is nothing of that kind that has been produced by the working class or the peasantry in India. And therefore, in this context, I think Dalits have a historic role to play, not merely to be concerned about themselves and fight for their, fight for their you know, immediate demands, but for fighting for larger humanity. You know, luckily, Suraj is here. I'm not telling him this, but I think Dalits have to play a historic role. Um, and that historic role, say for instance, in the 19th century, Marx begins to talk, Marx and Engels, for instance, begin to talk, ascribe to the working class. That the class is, while it is liberating itself, is also going to liberate the rest of the world. And probably we can say when Dalits are going to rediscover their humanity, right. they will help us to rediscover our own humanity in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Valerian. Uh, Anupama, would you like to provide your closing comments? Sure. Um, you know, I think I'll, I'll pick up where uh, Professor Rodriguez ended. And I think it is, you know, because so much of our conversation today has been concerned with, with, with the question of, you know, who is Ambedkar to us and, and the many Ambedkars. And this is something that Upen Bakshi many, many years ago brought up that there is, you know, there are many, many faces of Ambedkar and, and Ambedkar becomes uh, significant for us uh, given the particular conjuncture that we're thinking about. And I think here really the question of, of humanity and that kind of paradoxical relationship between uh, humanity and dehumanization, right? This is the kind of paradox that Ambedkar is dealing with across 
all of his work, I think this is something that's very, very crucial for us to think about. And in that regard, I think indeed this, this question of the, the great divide that is possible, something that I think Professor Rodriguez is alerting us to, between thinking about a kind of global Ambedkar, you know, who reads like, you know, as if uh, Ambedkar had already read Derrida or, you know, Benjamin and so on. So, you know, we've got these, these numerous ways in which Ambedkar gets read in and through others, as if, you know, that's the way that we want to engage and make Ambedkar relevant for us because he happens to read like a European thinker. And I think one of the things that maybe all three of us today have done is to kind of really resist that set of moves. Right, we're certainly thinking about Ambedkar's you know, global solidarities, the ways in which we might compare him with other traditions of radical thought. But that, that radical thought, and I'll come back to something that all of us have also spoken about, it's deeply embedded in questions of materiality, the body, and indeed a kind of rooted set of histories and experiences of community. And I do think um, that what Professor Rodriguez reminds us of, that you know, for the longest time, Ambedkar was kept alive through sound, through song, um, and to, through the fact that you know, people created popular archives of Ambedkar. The only way to get at you know, Ambedkar's writings now is through a set of you know, um, people who created public but also popular archives. They never had the sanction of the state, right? So whether it is Vasant Moon or people like Ramesh Shinde and numerous others who actually created, who had a sense of preserving that legacy. That's the project of mass intellectuality, right? Mass intellectuality is about the organic intellectual who actually gives to us, I think precisely that, uh, uh, you know, throws to us that challenge of, you know, how do you humanize yourself? So I, I think it's very, very crucial what um, Professor Rodriguez ended with. And I, I do want to highlight that. There are a couple of other things that I think we want to think about. This is um, sort of from within uh, the question of what's happening in India today. Suraj brought up the question of thinking about the new Brahmanism. But I think we can open up that question in slightly different ways. We might also think about you know, what is both happening to caste and its transmogrification but in what ways is capital also transforming in India? And if we think about caste capital, then what is the face of caste capital today? And how do we really begin to think about, you know, caste capital, that kind of very, uh, perhaps, you know, unwieldy term. But it seems to me that we need to, we're at a moment where we really need to rethink that. Certainly, if the Nehruvian project is over, the kinds of arguments that we have both about, let's say, passive revolution, uh, about Nehruvianism and Nehruvian, Nehruvian elitism and its response to the question of uh, minority politics and or political inclusion, we're no longer there, right? Um, we are in a government that has one, two, Muslim representatives, where it doesn't even feel the need to preserve the, the performativity of inclusion, let alone anything that is substantive. This is the moment that we're in, speaking of the moment of a kind of genocidal politics that is, you know, that, that's being sanctioned in the time, if you will, of a kind of biopolitical moment of COVID. So I think the biological and the political are being kind of, you know, stitched together again. And it might be worth our while to sort of think about, you know, what new ways, what new terms, what new theories we may want to, to utilize for thinking about this new relationship between caste and capital that's coming to the fore. Um, Brahmanism certainly as a system is quite distinctive from what Brahmins are doing. Um, there is also great debate, of course, uh, whether the RSS itself is politically significant or ideologically dominant in the current moment that we're in with the kind of Hindu majoritarianism. So I'd wanted to throw open that question of whether, uh, you know, we actually do have a kind of ideological center to the Hindutva project or that project itself has gone rogue. Um, I think as we see it happening with, uh, you know, uh, the sanction for, for random acts of violence, which, you know, when they accumulate actually produce enormous social fear and enormous anxiety. And that's indeed what, you know, the random acts of lynching have done, what, you know, other demo has managed to do. So what we have is a kind of politics of surprise, a politics of constant interruption 
it's making it very hard, it seems to me, to actually think about what new theories we, we may want to use. In that regard, and I'll end with this, uh, we do indeed seem to be at a new moment of global convergence. And maybe this goes back to Professor Rodriguez's question in a slightly different way. We are at a new moment of convergence, global convergence, it seems to me, where there are very distinctive projects of, uh, 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 let's say, um, the retreat of the state, if you will, uh, what we may call you know, variants of neoliberalism and so on. The arguments that have been used is really that this moment of political economy sees a new moment of primitive accumulation, right? And that it's through primitive accumulation, it's we're at a kind of new moment where the engine is starting again, originary accumulation. And that whether we want to think about the, the informal economy in India and, and uh, this, this uh, the long march, I think Suraj calls it the long march of, of migrants and how it is that this kind of devalued labor can actually create value for itself in a moment where it seems to be that it's land rather than labor that's significant. Think about models of speculation, think about real estate, think about the ways, you know, let's think about where value is actually being produced. It's certainly not through this kind of surplus labor that we have that is footloose, fancy free, and increasingly at risk of mass starvation and death. In the US, we've seen another set of policies of primitive accumulation, if you will, but through very, very, very high sophisticated levels of finance. Saskia Sassen actually has tried to bring these two worlds together, right? The moment of land grab in some parts of the world and the moment of you know, mortgage crisis and the eviction economy that we're seeing in the US. And to put those things together, this moment of global convergence might also be a moment for new kinds of global solidarities. I think we can only hope. But again, I'll end with something that Professor Rodriguez began by noting, which is that the very fact that we're having this global conversation means that there is surely hope. The fact that we are all teachers uh, surely means that there is great hope um, in terms of what might be produced. but. Um, I think this moment is grim and we have to think about this grim moment as, as good for thought or not. And I hope it's the former rather than the latter. Uh, yeah, thank you, Anupama. Um, yeah, Suresh, do you have any closing comments or? Uh... Uh, just, just, yeah, just two brief points. One is to just to pick up on Anu's and Professor uh, Rodriguez's point is, I think uh, in, in, in the Dalit liberation, uh, you know, lies, the, the liberation of other masses who are oppressed because Dalits kind of continue to carry the oldest surviving pernicious form of discrimination that modifies itself. So within the project of Dalit liberation, the investment that needs to be done, if Dalits are able to crack that, then I think there also lies a more hope that will maybe snowball into other oppressed societies. Second point is I think the uh, everybody likes historical Ambedkar. Everybody likes the frozen state of Ambedkar, but they don't like his sweat and blood, the intellectual progenies of Ambedkar, because that's so that's why they are fine with one Ambedkar. They don't like multiple Ambedkars. And I think that's where we are having a challenge with them right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just to yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, thank so, you so much. Uh, just one second. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Raghu, I'll just conclude the yeah. uh, by drawing on some of the key things that I think all of them have mentioned. The, uh, the an Ambedkarite project of uh, Swaraj, right, which is the Swaraj of the last person, last communities, and um, that being a project of humanization, as Anupama was saying, and uh, dehumanization being a kind of invisibilization. So in the present context, the uh, invisibilization of the sanitation worker, the migrant laborers, other uh, Dalit Bhaujan Adivasi communities and uh, working classes. So, uh, so to think of very concretely in, in today's time, I would say an Ambedkarite project would look uh, where, you, where you attempt to annihilate caste and patriarchy in everything that we are attempting to do, whether we are addressing the pandemic, whether we are teaching, whether we are um, doing other kind of uh, developmental work or state work, or even thinking about um, economy, right? And obviously any kind of uh, um, neoliberal capitalist logic goes against the project, uh, an Ambedkarite project of annihilating caste and patriarchy. So I think if we keep that uh, in some ways at the heart of it, which is a project of humanization, which is a project of 
challenging all forms of invisibilization, I would say, uh, as uh, all of them have kind of really nicely put out. So, uh, so yeah, to, to, to look at it in more concrete ways, if we think and think uh, of Ambedkar uh, as a living project right now, would be uh, would be very fruitful for all of us. Yeah, yeah. Over to you, Raghu. Thank you so much, all our panelists. Thank you so much, uh, Valerian, Anupama, Suraj, and Asim. Uh, just a quick announcement about our um, next uh, uh, BIC streams: the disappearance of women's voices in erotic poetry, the case of Kshetraya, That's on Tuesday, twenty eighth um, April at six pm. Again, thank you uh, so much, our audience.